all through and boy we were quite happy that we were able to do this. Um, he has been kind of working under my direction but the honest truth is he's been working on his own for the most part and I just kind of poke and prod him every once in a while to, to see if he's uh, thinking outside the box or, or pushing his box as far as I can. Um, with that, David, you ready? Outside yeah. voice. Yeah. Um, so, good afternoon, and I'm, like you said, David Harris, and I'm going to be presenting about tidal power generation. Essentially, the project I've been doing about tidal power generation in Cordova. So. Uh, the last thing touched was not. Okay, now try it. So, um, this, for the presentation, I will be essentially going over what I did, what I've done over the course of the semester, following approximately the same line of action, I suppose. So first, a little bit about feasibility and different locations that I looked at, and then some cons constraints. Uh, the most notable constraint was that there weren't allowed to be any fixed permanent structures which impacted which location I looked at. But then there were some other constraints. And then alternative, just as sort of an overview of alternative designs that have been used in the past for tidal power generation, essentially divided into drag and lift based. And then more detail on the design of the system that I decided to pursue further. So for feasibility, the Essentially, the data that I had to work with was some data gotten from three, four acoustic Doppler current profilers that NOAA put in the locations marked with red X's in 2007. And they, for about three months in the summer. And so, the, of those locations, for, for tidal power generation that doesn't entail some sort of barrier or barrage or dam-like structure, you have to have some sort of channeling. Usually you have to have some sort of natural channeling of the flow. So the upper, let's see there, the Channel Island and Selma Point locations don't have very much of that so that the current velocities were not adequately fast to make tidal power generation reasonable there. Yeah. But in the Old Log Boom and Mud Bay locations, there's you can see a lot more channeling of the water into a narrower area. So those were a lot those have tidal current velocities that are theoretically feasible for power generation. I also came across a Georgia Tech study of just power tidal power generation in the United States at large and they suggested some other places around Cordova. But because there was not any current data for those, and they were substantially farther away, I did not investigate those much beyond that. Um, like I said, there were the four locations that the NOAA data was for. And <coughs> these, the two graphs on this page, in the upper right-hand corner is a, is a graph of the tidal current velocities and also the direction for Mud Bay over the just a sort of arbitrarily determined period of time. And you can see the maximum it, it, for this period of time was just a little bit under three knots. The maximum for the three months looked at was a little bit over three knots. But then in the lower left-hand corner, there's a histogram of the current data above half a meter per second. So nothing below half a meter per second is noted there. And the green line is at one meter per second, which is the speed above which most existing systems begin to operate. But as you can see, there's um, there's a substantial amount of there's a substantial amount of time when the tidal currents are below one meter per second, but still if you but still still above half a meter per second, which is where the sort of 
somewhat arbitrarily determined point at which you start being able to get power out of the tides. Um, <coughs> so this was some of the design constraints and criteria. And like I said, the, the biggest rule was no permanent structures of any kind. Um, then based on this graph and this sort of information, the cutting speed, the, the speed at which it starts to provide power, was determined, the goal was about half a meter per second. Because as you can see this on this graph, the blue line is the power density given a certain cutting speed, and with the red line being the percentage of the time that the turbine is operating. So the percentage of the time that the turbine is operating falls off, as one would expect, starting at zero, basically for the cutting speed. But you don't really start to lose an appreciable fraction of the power in the tides until you get to more like this half a meter per second, and a little bit above that. So, so a question for you, when the the no permanent structures, you're talking dams and yes. big things, not yes, not like moorings or yeah. things, specifically impoundments or like a big tidal lagoon or a barrage or something of that nature. Um, and then though I didn't have a bunch of numbers as much, to the same degree to back it up, clearly cost and efficiency are things that are worthwhile to have as goals, low cost and high efficiency. Um, so as to the sort of general overview of types of tidal power generation systems that have been used in the past, they fall broadly into two, basically two categories, based on one of two, one of two aerodynamic forces, either lift or drag. So for Drag-based, it's essentially you put something in a fluid flow that has a lot more drag going one direction than the other, and then it causes it to rotate. So in this, this is a diagram of a wind turbine rather than a tidal turbine, but it's the same idea. You have the wind flowing this way, there's a lot more drag this, when it's rotating this way than when it's going the other direction. Um, so. These were, however, decided against. I decided against using something like this for two reasons. One, because the fact that you have a blade returning against, that's, that's moving directly against the flow of the water, makes it substantially less efficient. And also, it requires a lot more material to build a turbine that sweeps the same area of this variety than for a lift-based design. Um, and for something, if you were to make something like an undershot water wheel, that would sort of, you wouldn't be returning against the flow of water, you'd be returning against air, which doesn't have as much density and thus it's less of an issue. But then you have, the materials issue becomes even bigger because you have to have twice as, at a minimum, twice as much material as however much area that you are sweeping. So as far as lift-based, those can be divided further into two categories, with either the axis of rotation perpendicular to the flow of the water, or the axis of rotation parallel, parallel to the flow of the water. Um, the former can be called cross-flow turbines, and the latter axial flow. So for cross-flow turbines, those were also, I decided not to look too much further into that sort of design, because for cross-flow turbines, they operate at their most efficiently when they're spinning pretty fast. And one, the tidal current velocities around Cordova aren't that fast, and so to get it to spin fast would be tricky. And also, because it's in water and not in air, cavitation is an issue, and you, you want to avoid cavitation to get optimal. It's, your, your turbine is going to be more efficient if it's not cavitating. And so to have it spin reasonably fast, but also not cavitate, would be rather an issue. And so for that reason, 
it was decided to pursue essentially an axial flow, axial flow turbine. And the sort of broad question to answer for that was whether to do a ducted turbine or an unducted one. In the lower right hand corner you can see the there's a sort of it's not exactly true and it's essentially that. And that one's ducted, so it's got a shroud around it, and the other one is unducted. Um, and those two are two crossbow turbines that I designed that I drew in our desk inventor. David, you had a nice uh, definition of cavitation when one of our board members asked you a little about it. Could okay. you maybe redefine it for some folks here yeah. who don't uh, um, know much about it? So essentially cavitation is when you have, when the pressure, so uh, airfoils work based on pressure and uh, based on lowering the pressure sort of above the airfoil on the upper edge. So when the pressure created by the airfoil gets below the vapor pressure of the liquid, it starts to cavitate, which essentially is it vaporizes and it's, it's like a, an air bubble, as it were, inside in the water. And then when the bubble collapses, it can do a lot of harm to the turbine blade or whatever it is that it's cavitating against. But it also lessens efficiency. Um, so, let's see, so for the turbine design, the, like I said, the airfoil, clearly the airfoil was, had to be designed and selected to be efficient, but also for cavitation avoidance and for roughness insensitivity. Because if you're going to put something underwater for long periods of time, it's probably going to end up getting some fouling on it. Um, so the, that was those were some considerations for that. Then number of blades versus rotor solidity, that's sort of a measure of basically how much, if you look at the rotor from in front of it, how much of your view is blocked. So like a boat propeller has a very high solidity, of some I believe usually above one. Because if you look at that, the disc that the boat propeller spins through is completely blocked by the blades some of the time. Whereas something like a wind turbine has a fairly low solidity because if you look at the wind turbine, there's a few blades, yeah, but there's a lot of empty airspace in, in between those. So the more solidity you have, the higher starting torque you can get, which is important when you're trying to start, <coughs> when you're trying to design something to start spinning at a low velocity. But low, uh, high solidity also tends to decrease efficiency at operating speed. So you don't want to and you don't want to block too much of the space because then when it's actually operating, it's not going to be as efficient as if it were operating with fewer blades. So for this purpose, four thicker blades were determined to be a decent compromise between those. And then for the blade shape, it was decided to make them constant width. So instead of tapering them at the end or widening them at the base or anything, it was decided to make them constant width. Because when you put, if you have a turbine inside of a duct, you don't lose, you don't have to deal with tip losses. On a normal propeller or turbine, you lose power at the tips. But if you put it inside a duct, it, the flow can't really circulate around the tips as much. And so you don't lose power from that. And so to simplify construction, constant width blades work. Determined. And then the tip speed ratio was actually something fairly easy to determine because there is a mathematical formula for it. I believe it's 4, four pi divided by n is the optimal tip speed ratio. So that's the ratio, the ratio that the tip of the blade goes, the ratio of speed of the tip of the blade to the flow of the water. So like if the water is moving at half a meter per second, which is the full cutting speed, a tip speed ratio of four would mean that the tips of the blades are moving at two meters per second. And then 
fixed versus variable pitch and speed is sort of a question that also pertains to the electrical generation equipment. But along those lines, I decided that it would simplify, it would probably simplify construction and also have fewer, fewer moving parts. If a fixed, a fixed pitch turbine was made, and then it was designed so that it could produce power spinning at variable speeds. <coughs> um, and then, as for blade cross section, it was decided to use one airflow shape along the whole length of the blade instead of using one at the root and then a different one at the tip, because it's a lot tri it's a lot harder to make a turbine blade that's got one airfoil at the root and then a different one. Just one quick question. A variable pitch prop might reduce the cutting velocity? Is that the idea? So a variable pitch prop would theoretically, if you have, so if you have load on it the whole time, then yes. Having variable pitch, you could probably lower the cutting velocity. The way I sort of thought I decided to get around that would be by not having a load on it the whole time. Essentially, when it's not moving and when it's going, when it's going very slowly, before when it, can't, when it hasn't cut in yet, to have a slip clutch, a system by which the no, load, no generator load is applied to the turbine at first so that the turbine can start spinning basically with no load. And then once it's spinning, once the blade is no longer stalled, and the whole thing is contributing to spinning it, then the load starts to kick in and you start to produce power. So for Dutch design, I actually would not have thought of this, but Dr. Kayo said that I should mention it. The direction, the narrower end of these is the, the narrower end is the front, with the wider end being the back. Use your uh, example there. Yes. Because it's so, Essentially, you got the flow, if this is your duct, you got the flow going in here and coming out this way. And the reason for that is that ducts like this sort of, it's, it's composed of an airfoil shape, the cross section, then revolved around this axis. And essentially, instead of, instead of funneling the water or funneling the fluid to the propeller like it would do if it were facing this way, it sort of sucks the water or sucks the fluid across this location where you would put in the propeller. It sort of sucks the fluid across the disc, which is how it improves the, which is how it enhances the power generation. So for that, the airfoil, to use the question essentially that I asked for this was, what airflow would be reasonably simple in construction while still functioning properly. And also, thin versus thicker airflow, all of the ones that, like the models that I 3D printed, are all of thicker airflows because 3D printing a thinner airflow section would be substantially more difficult. But a thinner airflow section, if actually used for, in construction, would have the advantage that you could use that you could probably use one piece of material as both the inside and the outside of the duct. And then size or intercepted area of the duct is directly proportional to the, it's directly, it's proportional, so swept area is proportional to the amount of power you can get out of it. And so the swept area of the duct is proportional to the amount of power that you can get out of it. And I believe proportional to the cube of speed. Can you explain to people how you designed and made your ducts? You mentioned briefly how you made them. But. Yeah, so the way I designed them was essentially picking, was essentially test, checking different sorts of airfoils and using computer programs to determine what a good angle was for a fairly high lift over drag ratio and then for design, just revolve that, revolve it at that angle, revolve it pitched at that angle in a circle. Um, I'm not sure if that's... Do you want to pass them around? Oh, sure. Um, 
So these are the ones I printed and did a little bit of testing with these three, not with this one, which I will talk about a little bit in the next slide if you want. Test them out. So I'll put them there. <laughs> so for the testing, so I did a little bit of testing with the dots in a flume tank that Dr. Peg and I put together. It just sort of to get, inf get information about the, the velocity versus the, just sort of to determine of the three ducts there, there's one that's of an, one that has a venturi shape, so it's basically a straight line, <coughs> one that's a circular arc, and one that is an airfoil revolved around in a circle. And basically I wanted to see if, as I expected, the airfoil shape would be substantially better, would work substantially better than the other ones. So I'm not sure that the information that I got from it it's, it's useful for comparison purposes, but I'm not sure that it's useful for other purposes because there were a fair number of differences between the conditions in the flume tank and the conditions that I would expect to actually see. But, and then there's two pictures of the flume. This is from the top and this is with the duct in it. But the speed increase by I was able to calculate the amount by which the duct accelerated the flow based on the velocity and depending on the duct. So the gray line is the Clark Y duct, which was the, the Clark Y is the name of the airflow that was used to make it. The blue line is the one that was made with straight lines that was a venturi shape. And the red one, the red line is the one that was made with circular arc shapes. And so this is the graph that you saw earlier that had all of the speeds at my bay above half a meter per second. And again, the green line is the green line is the you know the cutting speed of being one meter per second, which is what has what I saw found most often in the literature about other tidal current turbines and stuff. If you took a turbine with that kind of cutting speed and put the circular arc duct on it, you would get the red line. You'd be able to cut in around 8 tenths of a meter per second. Now this is assuming that the numbers hold from the testing, which I'm not sure that they do. But still, comparatively, then if you put the Venturi duct around, you'd get the blue line, and the Clark Y one would cut in just at about 6 about 0.65 meters per second, which is a substantial improvement on the one meter per second, much closer to the goal cutting speed. So uh, then I've, I did not do as much based on system design, but some. The design point is basically the point at which the point at which the turbine is intended to operate most efficiently. And the design point for this was chosen at around 0.75 or 0.8 meters per second, the design point for the system, not necessarily for the turbine, because the turbine is going to be an accelerated flow. Um, for the mounting location and mechanism, the two things that have been done in the past are mounting it either on the seafloor and up a little ways, or suspending it from some sort of a floating platform. For this, a, f a floating mooring was determined to be a better option as it makes, it makes it more accessible, which is useful especially for something that's like a prototype or just being designed. And also, it will, it'll, with something like that, if you have a, single, if you have a floating mooring with a, connected only at a single point, the turbine will naturally, the turbine mooring and whatnot will naturally yaw into the flow. So you don't have to give it any other sort of mechanism by which it does that. And then for electrical generation equipment, the because the design was a variable speed turbine, I decided to design it around a DC generator instead of an AC generator because an AC generator being spun at a variable speed will generate 
variable frequency electricity, which is not, you can't then feed variable frequency electricity into the grid the way you, you it, it has to be at a constant frequency, I believe 60 hertz. Um, so it was decided to design it to pr produce DC power, and then if grid electricity were needed, potentially to smooth that out and then convert it from DC to constant, <coughs> constant frequency AC. Um, for revenue estimates, I did a little bit of stuff based on a based on a, an operations and maintenance cost per kilowatt hour that's a little bit over sorry a little bit under double the double the maximum at offshore wind farms which I think is a reasonably accurate thing the system could cost about sixteen hundred dollars per square meter of intercepted area if it were designed for a 20 year lifespan and placed in the mud bay location. So if you had a turbine with duct that, called, that swept, um, that intercepted an area of one meter, you'd be able to spend about $1,600 on it to still have it break even over the course of a 20 year lifespan. Um, cost estimates, I did not come up with any, any reliable cost estimates for the turbine because that's not the sort of thing you can just buy, it's the sort of thing you have to make, and costs for labor can vary substantially. But like I said, for operations and maintenance, I estimated that would be a little bit more expensive than the most expensive offshore wind turbines at about, I estimate, so I estimated that to be about eight cents per kilowatt hour operations and maintenance. The, for the duct, the materials for the duct would, pro, are, would be expected to be for, for the design that's about four meters in a four meter radius. I think for that, the duct materials would cost somewhere around $3,000, depending on if it were composite or a composite design, construction or metal construction. Composites would be cheaper to, for materials but probably would take more labor to construct, so it might might end out e might work out even. And then for the generator, again, for the four meter radius turbine, the generator would be expected to be about an eighth of the total cost at ten ten thousand or so dollars. And that concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? Yeah, they just wondered how large a uh, turbine would you anticipate to put? You're, you're talking about one single turbine, say at Mud Bay. How large a turbine yeah. would you? Think? So this, the design that I came up with, I guess, would be is of of a duct radius of just over four meters, four and a four and one eighth meters, and then a turbine radius to go inside of that of about three, about three and a half meters. Which would correspond to assuming assuming this increase in assuming the increase in speed is proportional to the area ratio between the two. That would correspond to increasing the speed of increasing the speed of half a meter per second to about seven tenths of a meter per second. And I think it it should be feasible. I think the turbine I have designed would be able to cut in at. 0.7 meters per second, which would be half a meter per second with respect to the free stream. How many kilowatt are you tossing on this Um so the amount of so it would only operate about 40% of the time. And during that not counting that 40% of the time, averaging the energy the power it produces over of the whole year. Peak. Average. The peak, so the peak is the amount of power that uh, that you can get out of a flow is proportional to the cube of velocity. So the peak power would be in like the hundreds of kilowatts, but the average power when running would probably be closer to 
maybe five or six. So if the, the power, went, the average power is going to be substantially less than the peak because the average velocity, the average current velocity is only about seven tenths of a meter per second, but the peak that we've ever seen was about 1.6 meters per second, which corresponds to a peak power in the hundreds of kilowatts. So are you anticipating, I mean, with such a variable thing, a uh, storage, like a battery bank, or some potential, so, to even the load out, it's hard to... Yeah. The, the thing about tidal is that the tidal power is very predictable, so you, you would know essentially exactly how much how much power you would have been produced at any given time. So, with, with that knowledge, you could, if it were part of a system by which you had electricity for Cordova, you could, you could, you could plan to produce less with diesel or hydro at the times when you knew that tidal power was going to be at its peak. Um, though, some sort of battery storage would work well, particularly with the turbine as designed, because it's designed around a DC generator, and charging batteries with, these, with a DC generator would work pretty well. And then the material, the, the apparatus to convert the power from DC to AC would already be there with battery storage, so you wouldn't have to have any additional apparatus. You would just be able to build a tidal power generation and system along these lines and then feed battery storage from that and then from the battery storage convert to AC and feed it to the grid. David, when you give your size of your duct, are you giving the narrow end or the fat end? The swept area. So, so the large, the, the intercepted area, so the big end. So the, the throat or the narrow end, yeah. the narrow part of the duct, the narrowest part in this design would be about three and a half meters in the radius. And the intercepted area, the, so the back end of it would be about four and, eight, four and one eighth meters in radius. That's where, that's where your turbine blades would be located the turbine, The turbine would be located at the throat, yes. yes. So okay. the, narrowest, the narrowest point. Right. So that, that would be smaller there in the, in the front. What? Yes. Yeah, so the yeah, yeah. okay. Are there any commercial systems that are currently in place that are similar to this? So there are, there are commercial systems in place. A, a lot of the commercial systems have sort of gone a different route than this system, which is we're trying the, this is, the route of a lot of commercial systems is sort of we want to provide we want to generate tidal power. Where in the world can we do this most efficiently, and where in the world has the most has the fastest tides that can be tapped. The idea behind this was sort of, we want to generate tidal power in Cordova. What's the best way to go about doing this? So most of the systems that I came across, like I said, had a cutting speed of one meter per second because they're designing things to put in places like the Bay of Fundy, which has some of the fastest tides in the world, or to put in I don't know exactly where it is, but there's somewhere, I believe, in the north of Great Britain that also has particularly fast tides. And they're, so they're designing stuff to produce, they're, they're designing stuff to for these much faster currents. And so it doesn't make sense if you're designing something for those much faster currents necessarily to have a cutting speed of half a meter per second because there's not comparatively as much power. With the tides around Cordova, there's a lot more, a lot more of the power, a lot more of the relative power is with, between half a meter per second and one meter per second, and so it makes a lot more sense to design for that range. So to answer your question, sorry, that was a little bit of a long answer, but to answer your question, nothing that's particularly similar that I am aware of. Yeah, I'd suspect that our, our current velocities that I've analyzed in a proposal I did would never even reach the upper limit of a turbine because they've got two limits. You've got the cut-in limit, you've got the natural limit of the turbine. It can't spin any faster to produce more power. 
So that's a natural the limit, upper limit of the term. I doubt we ever even reach the upper limit. Would you think so? Yeah. Yeah. So I'd like to steal one of Scott's ideas he pitched to me when we were future problem solvers. Mm -hmm. Is have you considered using kinetic energy because DC pumps water wonderfully, and you know if you have it at the log site and you pump it up to Crater Lake or some storage facility, then you could store your kinetic for when between. Anyway, that was hypothetical. Yeah. I just thought that was one of Scott's greatest moments. Scott got one. Well, doesn't Kodiak do that with their their wind power? They, they pump their water up behind their dam and they use the hydros for peak and, you know, but since wind yeah. is so variable, they do yeah. the kinetic storage. Yeah. I did not... I didn't look too much into any any kind of storage. Just it would be, and basically storage would help. That's true of almost all renewables. Actually, I can't think of any renewables that's not true of. But something like that would work. I didn't look too much into it. So, in your final design, would you go with the Venturi style because it was nearly as effective as your airfoil Y, or would you? Looking at a thin design, you know, one that you weren't able to test using the 3D printer. What do you think is the best reasonable compromise for making power? So the so first off, I it would the duct would be almost certainly thin either a Venturi style diffuser and a, either a Venturi style duct or a thin airfoil, but I probably would not. Like the, the design, as designed, it has one of those, two, actually as designed, it has a thin airfoil because at least at the rear section of the turbine, it's, it's very, very close to the Venturi design. It could be used with Venturi with probably not that much in the way of loss. As designed, it's got a thin airfoil, but it would not have to. And yeah, at any rate, the thin airfoil that I the thin airfoil is fairly similar to how a Venturi duct would. They're they're not that dissimilar. The whole back end of the duct. The whole the whole back end of the ducts would be essentially the same. It would only be a little bit of difference in the front end. Just to mess with you now. Okay. <laughs> you get a, in the marine instrument called port nozzles, your, your ducting. Okay, and a lot of the principles you're talking about, your power and blade design. Um, there was some, uh, okay, we're, we're talking ideal things here where the speed of your generator is giving you power and stuff. So you, You've got your blades, you've got a shaft that goes with generator, so you can have turbulence behind it with the shaft. I mean, if it's close coupled or how far back. Or, but I was seeing a design for wind generators where the shaft speed is what you're talking about. They put the generator in your airfoil. Yes. So that you had more the outside of the wagon wheel goes faster than the axle. So you get your speeds at less, but then it would also support your blades and it would be less turbulence behind. Yes. So I did a look a little bit at open center designs, which have been used somewhat for tidal power generation. The, the issue with that Basically, the, the issue with open center designs is that it's rather tricky to get a generator. It's, it's tricky to connect a generator to an open center turbine. The, the blades being attached at the edges, at the perimeter, is a little bit better in terms of strain on the blades, but we're not at According to the simulations that I ran in Autodesk Inventor, 
the turbine as designed isn't close to, it's not close to the limit of its materials. And because it's pretty tricky to, so, and then the other thing is, it does increase the turbulence somewhat behind it, behind the turbine or whatnot, to have the generator in the middle, but you're not getting very much power from the central section anyway, which is why most of this sort of thing will have a hub that's, uh, that goes out 20, 15 to 20% of the radius, because the, the, what's it, the, the hub, the blades, if you extended them to the hub, they're not really generating much power. You're not getting very much out of that. And so it's not, you're not really losing too much by putting a turbine there, by putting a hub and then a turbine behind there, because you wouldn't have been getting much from that anyway. So I did look a little bit at open center turbines, but because it's, because it's so much more difficult to connect the generator to the turbine, with an open center design, I did. I decided on a, a more traditional design in the end. So, what's your uh, what's your next step? So, the next steps would be to the next steps that I can think of would be to invest to try and get better cost estimates for some of the stuff because. I have some fairly broad cost estimates, but I didn't get estimate labor or anything at all. Um, so to do some of that, to I think probably a fairly shortly next step would be to build some sort of a scale scale model of prototype that's scaled down from the full size thing, but still to be put out there and test things about it, see how if the duct works as expected if the slip clutch and that sort of thing works as expected. And then also to see what impacts, if any, it has on the wildlife and the water flow, the sediment, <clears throat> and all of that sort of stuff. And now, a single turbine is unlikely to have much of an impact on any of that. But you, for most of this sort of thing, you want to build up slowly so that if you start to see that you're having a big impact on wildlife or the like, and you can stop before it gets too bad. And they, there has not been, a, there haven't been a lot of tidal power generation systems implemented, and so there's not necessarily a this is what you always have to look for. There's a this is what we think you have to look for it, environmentally when putting in tidal power, but there's not a this is a checklist, this is the stuff that will happen, this is what you should expect. So, in that, how fast do you expect those blades to rotate? Do you have an idea how many RPM? So, the tip speed ratio of the final design is four. And given the maximum current speed being about 1.6 meters per second, that gives you, that provides a maximum, a maximum tip velocity of about six and a half, about six and a half meters per second. Yeah, no. um, so about twelve knots. It's twelve knots, yeah. It's for the yes, the tips at the, at their fastest would be expected to be spinning at about twelve knots. So you're not talking super speed. No, we're not talking we're blenders. So it's yeah. not. You're going with density of water, so no, the tip tip spins a little bit slow. Well, but that would be fast enough to turn a generator. At yeah. RPMs to yeah, but it, it's not one of those where, you know, it's one where some of the designs supposedly fish can go through them, even though with a really solid Jeez. because they just, Somebody it's moving them. slow enough that. And, and David, you, you would have it geared, right? It would be uh, stepped up on the, on the generation or would you just have a direct drive? For what? If you have your turbine spinning at 12 knots, you could gear it to have a higher ratio to spin the generator? Yeah. Since, since the design already includes some gearing in the form of a slip clutch, it seems pretty reasonable to add more, to get it spinning at a more uh, better speed for energy, for electricity generation. What would your ideal 
we it seems like the old generators on cars with like at least you know, seven fifty to get them operating. So what are you what are you looking at? I have not looked as much into the electricity side of into the electrical generation side of things because I wish things closed. <laughs> not an electrical engineer. We, yes. we grafted in a hydrological but aeronautical. The question engine. is getting enough power density over time to make it practical. Yeah, so that's the first question he's that, answering. That also. Yeah. So I don't, I don't have as much information about the electrical generation side of things. Um, the torque that was being generated would be substantial. So you would be able to gear it to a much higher speed than lower torques without too much difficulty. With that, I'm going to try to let yeah. David off the hook, although you can ask him a lot more questions. And he's got more technical slides than oh, yeah. he would Too love to. He, he'd love to show you because that's his favorite part, and I wouldn't let him show it. <laughs> <laughs> we kept the presentation geek light for your benefit. <laughs> Um, this was a really good timing for this internship because um, the Science Center is part of the CREW, which is the Cordova Renewable Energy Working Group that's been convened by the native village of EAC. And there's a lot of other members of the CREW, the Forest Service, the Electric Cooperative, um, the school district even, and so on. And NBE became eligible for free technical assistance from the National Renewable Energy Labs. And so we had, at the end of March, a strategic planning meeting where all of uh, members from all those organizations that I just mentioned got together with two engineers from the National Renewable Energy Lab here in Cordova. And we had a two-day meeting talking about sort of the full suite of renewable energy solutions for our community that we could pursue over time and kind of want to get the picture of what we want the whole quilt to look like first before we start implementing individual pieces. And um, the goal that that group has set has been a 90% reduction in reliance on diesel um, by in 20 years or by 2020? I think 2020. I think by 2020 was the intense goal we set for ourselves. Right? Reduction in use of diesel, right? Yeah. So talking to the NREL folks, they love Cordova as a test bed because we have really good data about the environment here. And VE has collected good biomass data, good wind potential data. We have a lot of oceanographic data, thanks to the presence of the Science Center and other folks such as NOAA having collected data here. Um, and so it's kind of an interesting time for David to be doing his internship because he got to sit in on those meetings and participate. We also have um, CEC and the Science Center talking about, well, what would it look like to have a renewable energy lab in Cordova? Because um, the engineers from NREL have been saying, can we take our sabbatical here and just like work on stuff in your community for six months? And folks in, in the crew are going, yeah, that'd be awesome. We'd love more of your assistance. Um, dovetailed onto that, you know, the Science Center making plans for a new facility. And imagine if our new facility allowed us to have, instead of testing things like these technologies that David's developing in a Rubbermaid tote, but te testing them in actual tanks or flumes where you can collect really good data. Um, and really serving as a model for sort of self-sufficiency and better, more, uh, more locally generated energy production um, that could be replicated elsewhere. So there's just kind of a great convergence of things happening right now. Um, and it, it doesn't hurt that our mayor is also the CEO of our electric cooperative and that he is willing to really like uh, kind of bring up the visibility of these kinds of conversations um, at different levels when it comes to federal funding and that sort of thing. So if it's stuff that you're excited about too, um, it would be good to you know, participate and relay your interest to people like Clay Copeland or myself. Um, maybe we'll have more community conversations where people can learn more and get involved in thinking about how to move forward. Um, and then eventually, if you know, the Science Center or the City of Cordova or CEC is pursuing technologies like these or NBE, um, to just find ways to be supportive of them by asking city council to be supportive or um, planning zoning or that or the state agencies that are going to have to do permitting, that sort of thing. Um, so there's a lot of exciting stuff going on. I'm really excited that we got a, a great brain such as David's um, yeah, so not to cut in chat. on this project oh, and oh. I'm really glad that he was our intern so I want to offer him another big round of applause for doing yeah. this. Off the hook. With 
that. <laughs> we'll, we'll let him take the microphone off, and so you'll actually have to get close to him to actually hear him. Katrina, I have a question. Oh, I already went. Okay, good. Get the early swing. Yes. The thing counts. <laughs> You're going now? I just, I can't. That's why I can't. Okay. 